Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to the uh, fourth Tokyo Global Dialogue. And we are on day two. And we are going to uh, discuss about the economy, and that is the part of the US-China competitions and the uh, Indo-Pacific regions, uh, the, part of, uh, the second part of part one. Uh, I am Yukiko Fukugawa, uh, Waseda University, and it is my great pleasure to, moder uh, to serve as a moderator on this session. And today, we, uh, we are very lucky to have such a very professional uh, experts on this issue of the, on the uh, interface of economic and uh, uh, security issues in this region. And uh, 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 in along with the uh, title, I would like to set up the, the uh, first uh, uh, some remarks of the uh, uh, five participants. Uh, so uh, maybe we are uh, we are to start with uh, Ms. Emily Benson uh, from the U.S. Uh, she's a senior fellow, uh, growth chair of International Business Center for Strategic and International Studies (CSIS). CSIS. And then uh, we invite uh, uh, Professor Dr. Chang Yun Lin, academy member of the Academic Economy uh, Academy of Social Sciences, and chair professors and president of Institute for International Studies. And he is very already very known, very well, well renowned uh, expert on this issue. And then we are going on to the uh, uh, Dr. Vo Tri Tan. Uh, senior expert, uh, Central Institute of Economic Management, CIEM, uh, and uh, uh, he might be also uh, touch touching upon uh, the entity of or the presence of ASEAN uh, in these discussions. And then we are to invite uh, uh, Dr. Shiro Armstrong uh, from Australia National University. And uh, uh, he, he's also uh, quite established in this kind of issues, uh, in Japan especially, uh, not only in Japan probably, and he might be touching upon the uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, independent players in, in Indo-Pacific. Uh, in these regions. And then finally, we would like to invite uh, Professor Hideaki uh, Shiroyama, and he might be probably touching upon the very important issues of data uh, rules in these regions. Okay, so uh, let's get started with uh, uh, Ms. Emily Benson. Uh, thank you very much for, for your first remarks. Uh, first of all, let me start by thanking the organizers for including me in this panel. It is a pleasure to uh, be here, especially with such distinguished co-panelists. Uh, I'm tuning in from Washington, D.C., and so wishing everyone a pleasant evening uh, from this side of the world. I would just like to say a couple of words about the U.S. administration's approach to trade. Uh, and look at how it uh, is evolving in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So what we see in Washington is really a profound shift in the way that we go about trade and economic engagement. And this is something that has been coupled uh, on the part of the administration with a renewal of industrial policy. We can broadly categorize the trade strategy in very simplistic terms, of course, as protect, and promote, but the third element is really to secure. And this uh, speaks to an evolving export control policy, as well as efforts to uh, make sure that supply chains are secure and resilient uh, in things like semiconductors or critical minerals. So this is quite an expansive policy change. Uh, I believe that this reimagination of US economic policy could profoundly reshape domestic production capacity in the United States, and in so doing, fundamentally retool economic alliances and supply chains. So this could result in the reshuffling of old relationships and the forging of new ones. I think a very early stage evolution that we're also seeing is a slow move away from a period characterized by multilateralism and one that favors minilateralism, which is characterized by the proliferation of smaller, mostly sectoral agreements. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, of course, stands out from that, but overall, I think we're seeing a profound shift. 
Um, one quotation from Ambassador Tai from the U.S. Trade Representative um, really characterizes the administration's uh, uh, proclivity against tariff liberalization. She said that trade policy, quote unquote, cannot come at the cost of further weakening of our supply chains, exacerbating high risk reliances, decimating our manufacturing communities and destroying the planet. So what we see is the inclusion of social goals and an agenda into what was traditionally just focused on tariff liberalization. Uh, so the shift in industrial policy in the United States is captured in uh, three major pieces of legislation that were passed uh, during the Biden administration. One is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Chips and Science Act, of course, and uh, more recently, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, some of these offer clear benefits to U.S. firms. I, the one that stands out, of course, is the $52 billion in semiconductor incentives, primarily for dom domestic manufacturing. Uh, they also include a host of other incentives, for example, $500 billion total in climate funding. So we really do see a, a push to incentivize uh, the nearshoring or, in many cases, onshoring of supply chains. Um, however, that being said, the administration realizes it cannot onshore everything. This is particularly apparent in uh, advanced GVCs like the semiconductor industry. The United States can't produce everything. And this is where building uh, friend shoring alliances comes in. I think Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen coined the term last year, but this essentially means identifying friendly countries for deepened trade ties uh, and to relocate some supply chains out of China and towards those locations. This becomes very problematic quickly because how do you define a friend? And I think that's something that's very much under construction and will be likely to evolve. Uh, especially in the next couple of years of the administration. Um, another standout facet of the administration's trade policy is that it is eschewing some of the traditional aspects of free trade agreements in favor of these alternative economic arrangements like the IPAF and the EU-US Trade and Technology Council. These really so far amount to information sharing. Who has what? Uh, how can we build a stronger alliance? How do we cooperate on the person-to-person -person level, as in what is your email address? How can we really forge these new ties that have a lasting impact? Um, so let me just drill down a little bit on the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. I think most attendees here are familiar with it, but it's 14 partners that are divided into four pillars. And I think structurally, various parts of the IPAF make it unique. It is divided into four pillars, which three are kind of stationed under the Department of Commerce and one is under USTR. USTR naturally has the trade pillar um, while the Department of Commerce maintains authority over the supply chain pillar, decarbonization, and then the fair economy, which is anti-corruption and tax issues. It, there has been, uh, there have been many calls repeatedly for the IPF to produce concrete outcomes uh, but so far, progress has been relatively slow. I think there are some questions as to whether or not progress would be tied to APEC meetings in the fall. Given the complexity of both the membership and the topics under negotiation, I think that seems ambitious, uh, but time will tell. Um, another facet of the IPEF is that it really is the economic complement to the security strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but what also stands out is that the United States has gone to great lengths to make sure that China does not come up explicitly in negotiations. I talked to uh, one of the negotiating governments a, a couple of months ago, uh, well into the IPAF negotiating um, round that had kicked off uh, in, in LA and then in Brisbane, and the word China had not come up. And I think that really tells you that whether or not it's true, the administration is trying very hard to make this an affirmative agenda um, that can bolster and deepen economic ties while not explicitly being against another country. Um, so I think one fundamental question is whether or not this trade policy we think will actually succeed. We're into new territory. We're not seeking market access concessions. We're not um, pursuing things that are tried and true. 
Um, and so we're kind of moving into this new territory of smaller flexibles. Another great uh, example of that is a global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminum that the U.S. is negotiating with the European Union. And this essentially would reward decarbonized commodities while imposing what would essentially amount to higher tariff rates on countries with more carbon intensive products. That's a fu very fundamental shift in the way that we go about trade. And so whether or not all of this amounts to a grand strategy and whether or not it will succeed is contingent upon partners to help it move forward in the right direction. Uh, so I think it's early days. We're not quite sure what we will see, but if we all kind of start marching in the same direction and, and to the same tune, we can help make it a success. So let me leave it there and uh, I look forward to questions after uh, our panel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a uh, uh, very uh, uh, specific, uh, exp well analyzed explanations of what U.S. has been trying to do uh, in these Indo-Pacific uh, strategies. And then let me turn the mics to uh, Prof Professor Chang Yun Lin. Uh, well, probably China has a lot to say. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this group. Uh, also, us uh, good friends know each other. Uh, I just raised some points. We all understand that we are coming to a new era, which is different from the past. Kissinger said we cannot go back to the past. Uh, that's true. So we have to, you know, looking forward, try to create a better future. Uh, in the past, Asia Pacific created a miracle based on that economic integration, North America market, technology, capital plus East Asia production, labor force, and, and so on and so on. So we created Asia Pacific. And uh, but now, you know, we have a different situation because at that time, economic integration and coexistence of diversified political and security coexisting, so dual feature. And to some extent, economic integration overpass political and security concerns. So that's why the market and, you know, uh, uh, the free trade and, uh, you know, everything um, can move forward. But now the political and security factors have come to, to some time to the uh, forefront. It's the first consideration because of a strategic competition, because of uh, <clears throat> the COVID effect and because of many things. And of course, also because of uh, China's rise. So we, we are living in a different world. That's a fact. So the region is uh, divided uh, by different uh, sectors, uh, the factors. But at the same time, we have to realize economic integration still works. Still works. Because if you see that economic restructuring is going on, the cheap labor production networks moving to ASEAN and extend to India. So that's probably to uh, the, the some extent or the major factor of we call this Indo-Pacific. Because if we recall from Asia Pacific, it's uh, North America plus East Asia. And then in, with the rise of India, though not so quick, but still big, big effect, it's a big country. And India adopted the eastward policy. And ASEAN embraced India plus created ASEAN plus India. And then we, we initiated uh, RCEP, uh, include India. So we try to get India into this, you know, new uh, uh, region, regional framework. 
but in the, the last moment, that uh, quitted. And uh, we don't know how long and when India can join, but the door is open for all the time. So this is a natural seems process, uh, you know, uh, from Asia Pacific to Indo Pacific. Indo Pacific is not just India. If you see economic restructuring and Bangladesh, the other countries also join this, uh, the framework and they find their place to play the role as happened in East Asia. So we, we now is the same as all the Indo-Pacific, only India. Uh, India has a circle, India created the economic circle, uh, but, but, but without integration with East Asia part, I don't think it can succeed. So only thing, this integration of Asia Pacific toward uh, Indian Ocean area or Southeast Asia as a whole, of course, India will play the key role. So this is economic thinking. It's, I think it's a natural process. It's, uh, it's uh, help us uh, to, to uh, continue the prosperous, continue that uh, uh, innovation based on this restructuring, based on the division of labors for different kind of uh, advantages. Uh, but the problem, as I mentioned now, uh, we think too much about China-US competition, and especially if we recall in Asia Pacific, and US always has a political strategy, security strategy. You know, it launched this APEC summit because of single market in Europe, and the launched TPP because of the rise of China. And now, you know, and Indo-Pacific, uh, called first uh, in uh, 2016 by prime, uh, former Prime Minister Abe uh, of Free and Open. Um, but generally, he changed and tried to integrate China. But President Trump changed it. It went to a totally strategic political security consideration. So, uh, 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 President Biden changed to somewhat to include the economic, but political security concern is also, you know, uh, on the key factor. So I think the challenge for Indo-Pacific is whether we can uh, work like in the past as Asia-Pacific, economic integration and coexistence of different political and, and security concerns. Uh, we let it to, op uh, to open for a new arrangement, but it should not exclude, you know, uh, 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 prevent from, uh, prevent the other development, especially economic. Otherwise, India cannot rise at all without this, you know, integration with Asia Pacific. I don't think this IPEF can play the major role to integrate the region is because mostly because of bilateral ones. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, RCEP, uh, which, you know, they can create the key role to support this ongoing restructuring. Without this uh, restructuring, the East Asia will lose its, uh, you know, advantage in the future. And it's very crucial. And production uh, moving to Vietnam, to Indonesia, and, and they become a bigger economy, and China move to a, you know uh, the the higher level, and, and 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 so on, so on. The region. So uh, economists always think about the market, <laughs> but the problem is now though we have uh, uh, CPTPP, you know R, uh, RCEP, but now the politics and security can at any time block the market rules. And so we have to keep, that's my point, we have to keep RCP work and uh, based on what we agreed on, we have to keep the uh, CPTPP and it's open and uh, fortunately let China to negotiate. You know, uh, uh, you don't, don't just argue China does not, you know, apply the rules. 
for the rules will make them together. And China is open to join. And, and so there are the other new areas. So I think the challenge is whether we can work together again. And because U.S., as I mentioned, political security strategy always there, never, and to some, uh, uh, to some time is come to the forefront. But economic uh, um, factor still the key for U.S. Without East Asia, without you know integration, U.S. economy uh, does not work. Uh, lastly, for China, it's a great concern about you know the the um, the, the future about China. Uh, we have some uh, political change. But there is one thing for sure I can, you know, uh, personally, I think I have the uh, uh, confidence that if China wants to continue to rise, to develop, it has to do the three major things. One, that is market economy as the basic, you know, system. The second, so there are some calls, you know, the uh, nationalize and, you know, even make the uh, cooperative uh, uh, the, uh, the many things, but it doesn't work well. It's only markets, you know, based on the system. That's the basics. Uh, the second has to open and, you know, has to open to the outside and to go outside and receive the outside, you know, uh, uh, investments and technology and others. The third one, I think, is cooperation. Has to cooperate. And, and so, uh, to give China the, the room, and uh, China, of course, has managed to create the rooms to work. And uh, even it seems uh, there will be from the fight or war between China and US, but it's not that easy. I has to keep it very uh, cautious. So create our less worker, Together again, that's what I call for this session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was very impressive that you touched upon still the uh, very sh very much shared values for free trade in Asia. And uh, uh, still, I think uh, uh, we have a lot of rooms to keep the uh, free 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 trade uh, to work on on each individual Asian economy. And uh, uh, that should be the uh, common asset, not only for Asia, but for all of the world, uh, be, as long as uh, we tend to, be, to commit to the uh, openness. Okay, so let's go on to uh, Dr. Vo Tritan. Uh, probably you can mention also about the uh, positions of ASEAN. Uh, well, I think uh, it's quite natural for uh, ASEANs trying to be benefited, uh, even at the uh, very complicated uh, competitions between U.S. and China. Okay, so the floor is yours. Uh, Professor uh, Votritan, can yeah. you hear me? Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Chang, uh, Ung Ling, Ben Shen, uh, we cannot come to the uh, parts. Yes, but uh, the future is not also the linear continuation of the past. So the thing now is uh, become much more complicated. So uh, I take only two points. One is uh, what we think about the, uh, the problem of uh, fragmentation, uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, in the world uh, was, was a problem. And then uh, uh, I, I, I just talk about the, the role of ASEAN, how ASEAN can somehow you know, mitigate the uh, unwanted the uh, consequences of the process of fragmentation, right? Uh, not just uh, competition between the US and China, uh, rising protectionism over the last 10 years, US trade war as a part of competition between China and US, the COVID-19 and now, uh, many kind of geopolitical tension, for example, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, military conflict, on uh, leading to a tendency with the so called right, the one uh, can be uh, fragmented, uh, as I mentioned, uh, geopolitically and uh, geo uh, economically, right? Uh, 
right? And that's, of course, uh, uh, can lead to many, uh, you know, negative or unwanted uh, uh, outcomes or consequences. Inefficiency and distortion of resource allocation in the whole world, right? Uh, because of high adjustment costs. Even we talk about the ship of uh, uh, GBC, you know, can benefit for some country in the short term. And uh, more problem that international block become, become much more the stumbling, not the bending, and uh, politicized, right? And uh, multilateral institution, uh, institution like WTO uh, become much less effective one, right? And uh, most uh, serious problem, there's a uh, lack of strategic trust among the country, particularly among the power, and that high risk for the conflict and the retaliation, right? And uh, very hard for small uh, economy like Vietnam, you know, how to be dealing with all that uh, problem. So the key question, and we have a two key question, how uh, international community can mitigate the risk and a possible negative impact of that process, process of fragmentation. Uh, the second, how we can restore kind of uh, rule base, you know, we say open, free, you know, inclusive uh, integration in favor of win win game for all. And uh, more than that, for sustainable and uh, development, right? So uh, here, I think ASEAN can play an uh, important role for maybe two or three reasons. Uh, number one, uh, on the superpower, on the mid power, on recognize the importance of ASEAN centrality, right? And uh, we already have a mechanism ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus three, East Asia, no say about some ASEAN country, also member of G20, right? And ASEAN, like Shangri La, whatever, APF, ASEAN uh, uh, Policy Forum. On that, you know, good place for dialogue, right? Supporting global, regional, building block and architecture, right? And the second, uh, ASEAN already the hub for investment and, and trade, right? We join many FTA. So whatever the case, and we have to think about standards, the norms, criteria. And now, no, because of fragmentation, people talk about it fragmented norms and, you know, standards, right? But if ASEAN the hub, there's a, somehow, you know, even we take into account the new issue, e-commerce, digital economy, so somehow uh, there's a support for the conversion of the global regional standards and norms, right? Even for the new trade issues. And uh, last uh, but not least, ASEAN is uh, not just about liberalization, not just about open and free trade and investment. ASEAN is about community building. That's kind of example, right, paradigm of development, right, particularly for uh, inclusive and sustainable development. So that's a good example, you know, how the rule based open and free trade can bring about the uh, global regional cooperation and benefit for all, right? But uh, we also recognize the challenges for ASEAN. And uh, uh, I think there's a two of the key challenges for ASEAN, right? One is uh, how ASEAN can succeed in building the uh, community, right? The big C, right? AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, ASEAN Security Community, and ASEAN Social Concern Community. And the second challenge is, uh, because ASEAN just the linkages, not like the EU, right? Uh, Intergovernment linkages. And uh, ASEAN Secretariat not play the role like the uh, EU Parliament on the thing. Right? No. So uh, ASEAN also recognize the right of each member can have bilateral relation with the outsider. So uh, the second challenge is how ASEAN member can handle appropriately bilateral relation with the power in the of ASEAN as the whole group, common voice in the world. 
So I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Actually, um, a decade ago, um, the ASEAN, so-called ASEAN centrality was, well, some people saw it as a kind of ASEAN story, but now it is, um, it, it is getting a big voices, bigger and bigger voices now. So, uh, well, ASEAN may be the uh, uh, leader of the uh, so-called Global South and any other entities in, the, uh, in this region. So let me uh, turn the mic on to the, uh, as I said, independent players like Japan and Australia. So uh, please, uh, uh, Shiro, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kogawa san. Uh, it's a real, real great pleasure for me to join this panel. Uh, and thank you to Jaya for the invitation. Um, as Kogawa san said, I'll talk about sort of third nations or the rest of us outside of the United States um, and China, uh, and hopefully bring a perspective there. Uh, and what I really want to talk about is the threat to the international economic order and why we need to worry about this. Um, I think we're in a place where security considerations are starting to dominate economic considerations in the region, as some of my panelists have said. Now, economics and security have never been separate, um, but of course now I think we're seeing they're increasingly entangled and damaging to both. This is due to great power strategic competition, uh, but also major powers intervening in markets for domestic political or geopolitical or strategic reasons. So we're seeing an increasingly assertive China that's used economic leverage against smaller countries or other countries, and the United States walking away from its leadership role um, in the global trading system. Uh, and it's becoming a source of uncertainty. Uh, Emily Benson nicely, clearly outlined where the administration's at on all this, I think, and her description of the administration moving away from multilateralism to minilateral agreements or minilateralism uh, is a bit of a worry, and I'll explain why. Um, you know, the United States is creating arrangements exclusive of China. Um, now, this is a trend I think we want to be very careful about. Uh, the United Kingdom, in response to a rising United States in the post-war period, wrapped the rising power in rules. Um, of course, we've got a, a set of assets from that period now um, centred on the WTO, uh, but the problem, as we all know, is that the WTO rules are outdated. Uh, we have regional and plurilateral and bilateral agreements, but those are patchy um, in their coverage and inconsistent in their rules. So really, I want to um, argue for the importance of the multilateral trading system here, uh, because that is under threat and that directly threatens our national and global prosperity. And the bilateral and regional agreements that make up the multilateral trading system, of course, have the WTO at its core. East Asia relies on that system, the multilateral system, more than any other region in the world, given the economic ties between our countries help manage relations um, between states really where there are still systemic political differences. No need to look any further than Northeast Asia. But now we're seeing weaponized interdependence, the securitization of trade, and what some call geoeconomics, the use of economic tools in pursuit of geopolitical objectives. So these risks that have always existed, um, that have been managed under US-led order, uh, are now tending to dominate the calculus for, for many. The positive sum economic exchange is being viewed as zero sum, where um, to gain, another party has to lose, or even negative sum, where in an effort to undermine the competitor, say between the United States and China in strategic competition, um, there's a lot of self-harm going on as well. Uh, economic interdependence is being seen as a vulnerability instead of a source of prosperity and security. Uh, and I just want to explain that uh, and wrap up. Um, you know, I think multilateralism can preserve policy space and policy options uh, and act to diffuse economic and political power. And I think um, Vo explained nicely the importance of these principles for ASEAN and how ASEAN organises itself uh, to preserve this policy space uh, and also to diffuse uh, this economic and political power. 
Uh, and Professor Zhang Yunling talked about the importance of markets. I think this is where uh, a recent episode we can look at is um, lessons from Chinese trade sanctions against Australia uh, and the ability of Australian exporters to find alternative markets. Now, that was not cost-free, came with significant cost to some exporters, but it underlines the importance of open and contestable markets, um, the multilateral system being it a source of resilience for countries and how an open global trading system can blunt the unilateral use of economic weaponry. It reduces the costs of targeted countries, costs to targeted countries like Australia in this case. Uh, and I think from all I've said, it should be pretty clear, there's a pretty important security value um, from, uh, that we reap from an open multilateral trading system. Uh, unilateral sanctions have unintended consequences. I think that's a, a fairly obvious point. Uh, they quite often backfire. That's something that doesn't get recognised when countries deploy these sanctions, economic sanctions. So if you're thinking about small open economies, as we think about them in economics, or even middle powers strategically, um, Australia, Japan, what protection do we have? Well, not just the rules, which are very important, but international markets. And I think that comes from the example I gave. So uh, a big takeaway I'd like to propose uh, from this is to continue to enmesh the major powers in markets and rules uh, and the importance of the WTO uh, and the political security importance of the WTO at the center of that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, well, most probably uh, the commitments to the uh, multilateralism uh, should be the uh, very common uh, now the significance for the uh, so-called rest of others, uh, not being able to depend upon the uh, uh, huge domestic uh, market sites uh, like US or the China. So we may come back to this point again probably. Okay, so uh, please, Shiroyama-sensei, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sensei. And uh, I'd like to talk about the, the economic order of the Indo Pacific and the Asian Pacific from the, how to say, a little bit narrow perspective of digital governance, which is an important topic, but it's not necessarily uh, dealing with the economic order in general. Uh, I will speak in Japanese, so yeah, please utilize the translator. For me, Rather than talking about the general international economic order, I would like to restrict my discussion to uh, the uh, uh, domain of data governance in Indo-Pacific and Asia region. This is an important uh, sector. As uh, we have uh, heard, uh, things like IPEF and Quad insecurity well, uh, data governance uh, uh, functions in a different dynamism, so it can be an interesting uh, example. Under the digital economy, the free uh, cross-border data flow is a fundamental factor needed. So free cross-border data flow can be one uh, public policy objective and this has been emphasized. But in view of the public uh, policy objectives, there are other objectives as well. Well, of course, uh, uh, the free cross-border data flow is important objective. Uh, the personal uh, information protection, cybersecurity, effective implementation of the financial regulations, industrial policy, LCELSI, ethical, legal, social implications, or securities that we have been discussing. From this vantage point, free cross-border data rest, uh, uh, flow, uh, uh, some of them uh, try to restrict, uh, regulate them, and seek for data localization. How can we cope with this? Naturally, the response would differ from one country to another, one region to another. Globally, there's the United States domain, EU domain, and China domain. So there, these are three major domains for data flow. 
the United States has tried to restrict uh, uh, the constraints on the free data flow in the U.S. ROK FTA, which went into effect in 2012, there was this, uh, for the first time, provision concerning the free information flow in the e-commerce chapter. And this stance has been kept at the USMCA, including U.S., Mexico, and Canada, or also in the Japan-U.S. Uh, digital trade agreement. We are liberal democracies, all of us, but EU is a bit different because EU considers personal data protection as basic rights. So this, this general data protection regulation, which went to effect, and uh, the uh, adequate uh, adequacy level of protection for the personal data is the prerequisite to transfer personal data outside of EU. And then, compared to that, in China, safety has had the priority. For example, in 2017, this, this network safety law uh, was enacted. According to the Article 37, it says, when critical inf information infrastructure operator collect, generate critical information in the PRC, this must be kept or stored inside. If there's a need to offer this to outside of PRC because of business reasons, safety assessment should be made in accordance with regulations set by National Work Work Network Safety Information Agency together with the state council organizations. So whether to uh, secure uh, the free flow or to uh, put priority on the safety, there seems to be a confrontation between the U.S. and China in the geopolitical confrontation. That aspect has uh, been emphasized on the one hand. But at the same time, in the RCEP, this is a regional uh, comprehensive economic partnership. Japan and China, Australia, or ASEAN countries, Malaysia, compared to Malaysia, Singapore, Laos, Thai, Cambodia, all included. Uh, they agreed on RCEP. To a certain extent, uh, this uh, cross-border data transfer is uh, admitted. Uh, of course, uh, there is a possibility of intervention uh, from the perspective of the public policy. There's a regulation to that, but still, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the free flow, cross-border flow of data is admitted. Uh, in the WTO, there's a discussion going on. In the beginning, uh, China didn't participate. In the midway, uh, China came in and uh, playing its role in the negotiation. So including China, there is a possibility that the agreement to a certain extent with limited scope is a possibility. But what's more uh, difficult is that agreement with India would be more difficult. India, in its relationship with other countries, or in its relationship with the global uh, business corporations, India put emphasis on the data sovereignty, and the government itself has played the role of data administrator. So in WTO, for example, the negotiations of the e-commerce rules, or there's an attempt on the cross-border information free flow, its liberalization. So India has been rather hostile against that. In 2019, there was a G20 summit meeting in Japan, in Osaka, and Japan proposed a DEFT. China uh, uh, supported it, but India didn't agree. So in the uh, area of data governance, the framework, including India, would be difficult to achieve. That's one unique feature of this area. In the geoeconomic context, what will happen to this India move would some, is something that we should uh, continue monitoring. Now, 
Looking at the Indo-Pacific ex-India, there are various interesting uh, movements. In Singapore, Chile, New Zealand, they came up with the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement. And then Australia, Singapore came up with the uh, Digital Economy Agreement. In a step-up manner, the data flow-related provisions were improved. So the framework uh, building is moving forward. In CPTPP, Australia and Japan is included in the ASEAN. Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore are participating. They support CPTPP. In WTO, in the e-commerce negotiation, co-chairman is Japan, India, Australia. So that's happening as well. That's a very interesting aspect of the area of data governance. I just showed you examples. So this is a dynamism that we are witnessing. And in the wider context, what will happen to this sector? That's a very interesting case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was uh, quite a detailed explanation So what's happening about the uh, data rules making. And it looks like uh, very important issues for the further trade uh, where, for which the Asia has been very much dependent upon. OK, so we have a little bit of time. Of, well, probably uh, my strategy is to invite everybody to a certain big questions that seems to be quite interested by uh, five uh, participants. Um, uh, well, actually, I think uh, still there is a very strong commitment towards uh, uh, free trade, or the, even though we cannot go back to the past anymore, uh, because it, it is very important for Asia uh, why? Because we are very much dependent upon the uh, free trade in the past. So we can never give up all the, uh, the basis for the economic success. But the trouble is uh, how we can maintain uh, this uh, very positive and healthy basics. Uh, so uh, let me turn the mic on to the U.S. policies. Uh, I think media has been very much dominated by the uh, security uh, reportings now, now these, these days. But uh, as long as they, almost all the countries are suffering from inflation nowadays, uh, one of the good positive responses to let the uh, trades to contribute uh, to um, uh, keeping the price. Uh, international price, I mean. So definitely free trade has a room to contribute. And uh, uh, let me uh, ask uh, Ms. Benson about the US policies to um, keep the uh, free trade as a kind of uh, policies to fight back against inflation. So people say that high fence, uh, but in a very small yard. So we would like to know how small the yard can be in the U.S. policy now? Well, thank you for that question, and thank you to the panelists. I learned a lot from each one of your remarks. Uh, and I, I agree with Shiro that the uh, shift towards mini lateralism is cause for concern. Um, speaking to your question on inflation, I think that's kind of a politicized hot button question here in D.C. at the moment. And there are a lot of questions about to what degree a more open trade policy would actually reduce inflation. And the latest study that I saw said that it would probably make one percentage point of a difference, uh, but that's temporary, that's short term. I think the real long-term question is to what degree we incur costs from incentivizing the shifting of supply chains away from certain countries and towards others. Another good question that's come up in a lot of the research that we've done is, Let's say we want to shift supply chains to where? Uh, that is a really big outstanding question. And I think at the beginning of the administration, a lot of uh, signals pointed towards Mexico. They're uh, a close partner. They have relatively inexpensive labor. They have a desire, it would appear, to deepen economic integration with Canada and the United States. For a lot of reasons, that hasn't really materialized. And so I think what that means in the longer term is that the cost of failing to pursue a more open trade policy will probably 
continue to drive up costs. The administration, meanwhile, is trying to balance those costs with domestic incentives, uh, like the three packages I mentioned earlier. I am not convinced that those packages alone will be sufficient in encouraging companies to move entire supply chains. Uh, we're really asking a lot. And if you look at the chip sector on its own, $52 billion is nice, but it's not a panacea. And so I think what we'll probably see is that as ship supply chain shifts, we'll see uh, demands to make these spending packages iterative, meaning they will have to become frequent and large. And uh, I think what we will probably see is some loss efficiencies, but the administration seems to think that those loss efficiencies are worth it from a security perspective. Uh, and I think security in this sense means uh, solar panels, it means t-shirts, <laughs> it means semiconductors. And so it, it really is a sea change, uh, but I'll, I will leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Chang Yun Lin. Uh, how is the China's uh, commitments toward the further int integrations as well as the uh, free trade? I know that you've been working hard on it, and uh, uh, you mentioned about India, but it seems also very difficult to invite India to the uh, East Asian types of economic integrations. Uh, very much committed to. Um, uh, opening up the market as well as for indirect investment. How China may be able uh, to contribute? I think for India, as I mentioned, it's still a long way to go, come along with this, uh, you know, open integrated framework. Because the India economy as a structure is quite different. It's a, uh, it's manufactured, uh, you know, production still accounts for a smaller part of the whole economy. That means it has a very limited network with other uh, economies. So it's uh, rules and policies, and uh, it's uh, quite different from that's uh, when I <clears throat> personally, you know, uh, discuss or when I let this regional group try to formulate FTA. So with India, they talk quite different, you know, uh, quite like China in 1990, and a lot of concerns, you know, because of a domestic reason. But as I mentioned, you know, it's a big country, it's a big economy, it's potential, uh, you know, it's, it's we have to find a way to let India to ha have con confidence gradually. So if as I mentioned, if Indo-Pacific can play the role, it's how to find a way, how to encourage an, an India to join this regional framework uh, economically. You know, politically, <clears throat> you can't let India only on the one side. India always consider is number one. <laughs> so uh, has its own uh, considerations. So no country can actually you know, uh, just let India on one side, including Russia and the uh, U.S. and so on. It's a multi-concerns. It's a major concern is still how to keep its uh, superposition in the Indo uh, in Indian Ocean. But economically, I think there is growing need and pressure for India, for government to, to integrate. Because India is a, is an old member of WTO, but when India joined, it, it almost changed nothing. So the regional integration really can change uh, India to come along. Uh, but trade is another thing because, you know, whatever happened between China and India, the trade continued to grow and because they need market uh, each other, but their own concern, only concern is uh, not let China dominate uh, Indian market. But that's what happened in 1990 in China. We we're always concerned uh, because we have Hong Kong at that time. It's different from India. And if, uh, uh, but so India, uh, the Japan firms uh, is find different India when uh, they, they come to into India. <laughs> so I think the region, if we talk about uh, 
uh, economists, we talk, I hope, as I mentioned, more about economic Indo-Pacific, you know, how to get India uh, uh, to into this uh, uh, enlarged regional economic framework is, is very important. Uh, but no country can change it, but only the, the group, the framework, because as happened in China, China joined WTO, and, and China negotiate and then uh, with with ASEAN. We spent 10 years negotiate with ASEAN. And, uh, you know, we almost failed when we uh, uh, conclude this investment treaty. I wrote to Prime Minister, it's a last chance. Uh, whatever happened, we should conclude the negotiation. So we need uh, 10 years. But India should, uh, we have to find a way. Uh, let you know, uh, politicians and um, army people they, they consider the other things, but economically, I think uh, it's very crucial. But it's still open, as I mentioned, China, you know, though whatever changed in Chinese domestic politics, but there's one thing, and China needs to open and it's eager to negotiate with other partners. So that's why it's we, we had organize a real team in, in the country to prepare for negotiation for CPTPP. And uh, we have worked for a long time. It's very seriously prepared. Ex exam every every uh, part of uh, CPTPP on how to negotiate. So th this seems uh, uh, India still has have not come so closely <laughs> to, to the regional integration. But I think, uh, uh, however, if we talk about Indo-Pacific, we can on, we cannot only talk about follow that political and, uh, strategy. But uh, lastly, one point, as uh, Shiro mentioned, uh, it's a it's a problem now. The trade and investment can be oftenly now used by you know foreign relations tool, and for any country, not just the big country, uh, they use more probably, <laughs> you know, it's more than one fourth of China-US trade and uh, you honor this kind of uh, uh, special rules and uh, blacklist. Um, but generally the trade continue to grow and also same in India. So I hope that uh, we work on this to support this integrated uh, approach, an open approach. Thank you. Um, but the pressure for us to the to the government, to policymakers, they have to consider. <clears throat> okay. Everybody Sorry. knows that India inviting India to a certain international framework is uh, sometimes very difficult to do. But uh, uh, we we do hope uh, <clears throat> India's uh, further commitments towards the uh, positive contributions uh, for the whole. Uh, regional economy. Okay, so let me invite uh, Dr. Than, Than uh, for Tri Than. Uh, uh, it looks like that Vietnam has been very much benefited at uh, this moment, uh, thanks to the uh, commitments to a uh, traditional uh, free trade regime uh, by CPTPP members, as well as the uh, uh, members of EU uh, FDA. So, uh, uh, in along with the uh, uh, multinational companies uh, in, in global communities seeking for the uh, so-called uh, kind of China plus one, <coughs> Vietnam seems to be quite benefited uh, out of this uh, framework. And uh, But on the other hand, uh, if we look at the ASEAN, ASEAN has been growing very powerfully. And in the meantime, integrated ASEAN markets should be even larger than Japan. So uh, ASEAN is uh, quite uh, uh, good samples of traditional free trade economic success, and uh, Vietnam seems to be quite benef uh, is Vietnam is quite a typical, uh, even though as a latecomer, but still uh, it looks like it. But uh, if we look at the ASEAN, other ASEAN members, Indonesia is getting more and more uh, inward looking. Uh, kind of trade policies, including uh, resource nationalism, etc., and the other members are not necessarily very much committed to the traditional patterns. So, 
uh, what is your uh, assessments about the ASEAN centrality and how Vietnam probably will be able to uh, keep a kind of leadership in, in ASEAN? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, two things. One is uh, about the uh, ASEAN centrality. Of course, uh, what we mean by uh, centrality, you know, different way. But uh, for me, uh, two things is the most important if we think about ASEAN centrality. One is uh, uh, there's a kind of uh, place, right? Uh, we can exchange the view. Uh, we can uh, uh, have a new ideas for helping building block in a uh, uh, Asia Pacific region in the broader sense, maybe uh, uh, Pacific uh, Indo-Pacific region. Uh, because uh, India, yeah, even they have many problems uh, inside, but anyway, uh, India also have a look is, look is uh, strategic, right? So they, that's a long-term vision for the India, and they understand that. I talk with uh, many uh, India scholars and uh, politicians, I think I, I, my feeling is, is, is that. So ASEAN is a guy of that, and uh, they have a confidence, uh, somehow trust in ASEAN as well. They understand that ASEAN is not too big, not too small, right, as a group, and uh, located in a very a geopolitical uh, place, very important that. Uh, second, if we think about ASEAN centrality, you know, now uh, more uh, also about, as I mentioned in presentation, that's the hub for investment and trade, right? And if you ask any investor would like to invest in ASEAN, uh, they just not look at Vietnam or Indonesia. Of course, they have some focus. But anyway, they think ASEAN as the whole market at the common market, right? So there's a building uh, uh, AEC, ASEAN Economic Community as the key for make sure that we have, a, uh, the investor, they can have confidence or trading partner, they have a confidence in uh, dealing, uh, in, in doing business with the uh, ASEAN. So centrality, that's two things. And uh, of course, there are challenges, right? And uh, I think, uh, now go to the second question. You know, uh, if we think uh, ASEAN already, because of somehow there's ASEAN way, so already a lot of discussion about the champion uh, for ASEAN integration or the leader or whatever. Some uh, they say maybe uh, Indonesia. In Indonesia, look at the GDP, population, and everything, and experience in the past, right? Uh, Indonesia can be uh, a <laughs> kind of, you know. Uh, uh, leader for ASEAN, but uh, my view is that uh, I, I don't think we, we can pick up uh, 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 just one member of ASEAN to be the leader, right? But we think about uh, two things, one is a group, right? Now, two or three ASEAN countries can go forward, right? in many raising ideas, whatever, uh, in global arena. So many say there's maybe one somehow for the later come, maybe Vietnam or another one like uh, uh, Indonesia, but Singapore, you know, they have so many uh, new ideas and they uh, only go ahead. And uh, before uh, I remind that, before ASEAN also, together with 10 minus X principal, right, we follow for, services, liberalization, we also talk about two plus X, right? Kind of X fighter or go ahead. Another thing is because ASEAN is a try to have a building community to narrow development gap, right? So even talk about CNMV and then uh, ASEAN SIG. And now they talk about CNM and VIP, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, right? I don't know whatever that's the right thing. And ASEAN, uh, for ASEAN 5, but that Vietnam can play a good bridge, a role of career bridge between the later economy uh, like uh, CNM and more advanced ASEAN. So Vietnam, that's, in that sense, can play a good, good thing. Okay, I stop here. 
Okay, thank you very much. Was a powerful commitment. Uh, and uh, let's talk about a little bit about the uh, maybe the rest of others. Well, after all, uh, Japan and Australia, uh, we are not the uh, member of huge economic integration pact like ASEAN or EU. But uh, definitely, we need some uh, healthy working multilateralism, right? So uh, maybe let's get started with Shiro-san about your ideas, how we can move these situations, uh, very much stacked multilateralism, probably by who we can work together and how we can, where we can start the rule making, probably Professor Shirayama may be able to touch upon the data making things. Uh, EU has its own, China has its own, US has its own, and then uh, what would happen to the rest of others. So uh, maybe uh, can I ask uh, uh, Shiro-san? Yeah, thanks for the question. That's not a, a, an easy one to address, but um, thinking about all that's been discussed, um, you know, I think we have to be clear of our assumptions first. Um, you know, I was in the United States um, last month and talked to some of Emily's colleagues and others and came away deeply worried that as someone summarised, you know, India's been um, recalcitrant in international economic forums. We can expect the United States to be, uh, to act in a similar way, uh, at least not a leadership role in, in the next few years, at least. And so, with that understanding, um, we need to protect the system and maintain openness towards the United States, of course, and engage deeply the United States through IPEF and any avenue we have. Um, uh, and, and then also to recognize, I, I think, that um, China's role in this, uh, despite its transgressions and the worries that um, some have about its rise, it, it has a huge stake in the existing system. Um, and that's that's been made clear a number of times. I mean, this multi-party interim arbitration agreement, the MPIA, um, means that China signed up to this so that the WTO rules are still enforceable for those 27 odd members uh, that are signed up to the MPIA. So, you know, we're not um, starting from scratch by any means. I think it's important to recognize the assets we have. Um, you rightly said, Australia and Japan are not part of ASEAN or EU or NAFTA, uh, but Australia and Japan are part of CPTPP and RCEP. And I think that's a pretty important starting point. And um, both Australia and Japan support very strongly um, multilateral processes, plurilaterals. And we have a, demonstrated our deep strategic interest in an open international rules-based system. So, you know, what can we work with? Well, I think we work with those assets that we have um, and help lobby countries. You talked about some of the difficulties you invoke in ASEAN, um, resource nationalism, your slide towards protectionism. I, I think working um, with ASEAN through the RCEP process to keep those markets open and keep going forward. And I think RCEP should be um, recognized as an important breakthrough, you know, through this period of huge global trade uncertainty, ASEAN kept um, RCEP alive. It's an, came, the idea came from Indonesia and ASEAN, uh, and ASEAN steered it to completion. That's a huge boost to multilateralism and to keeping this as part of the world open. There are opportunities, like Shiroyama-san said, on the digital um, governance area to um, <clears throat> have these agreements expand and proliferate. Um, and I think having closer um, alignment with the economic cooperation agenda within RCEP. There's a pillar within RCEP that's beyond um, technical cooperation, capacity building. Now, this is a, an institutional architecture within RCEP that has a minister's meeting and in fact, um, ability to have leaders meetings each year. So, you know, they're not gonna get together and just talk about capacity building. Um, we wanna talk about upgrading of rules, um, uh, keeping open to non-members, expanding membership. Um, and I think Australia and Japan have an important role to play in this, in CPTPP expansion, uh, and to encourage, of course, ASEAN, but also India to remain open and commit more fully to openness. Um, talked a bit about the, the difficulty in dealing with India. It hasn't committed to openness, um, even to the extent that 
China did in the 1990s, as, as Zhang Yuling made the comparison. You know, Australia signed a, an agreement, an economic agreement with India uh, recently. That is the least ambitious agreement Australia has signed, and it's the most ambitious agreement that India has signed. Um, it tells you the starting point, and um, Bangladesh has recently overtaken India in per capita GDP, and I think Bangladesh has shown um, what you can do when you specialise in your comparative advantage. Um, so there's a lot of work to do there, but as I mentioned, there are huge assets um, to work with, um, uh, and it's a matter of getting the political will and the motivation aligned uh, between key countries here to make progress where we need to. Yeah, and I think, sorry, just to mention the last thing, MC12 in the WTO um, uh, was a, a breakthrough, a mini breakthrough last year. Um, and I think that is important momentum to, to build on. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how about Shuriyama Sensei? Uh, especially yeah. digital rules, maybe? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Kukawa-sensei. And basically, I shared a view of the Shiro-san that uh, countries just like Japan and Australia have a mini role, what they can play, you know, in, in the restoring this uh, international economic order. Uh, for example, in the case of the, the data governance issue, I discussed about, you know, Japan is in a unique position in that, you know, somehow the... Uh, Japan is playing a role of the breaching the several camps. As I mentioned, that the US and the EU and China is the major uh, player in this process. And relating to the relation with the US, we have uh, Japan has an US-Japan digital agreement, you know, as an offspring of the uh, TPP. And uh, relating with the EU, Japan has an uh, adequacy agreement with the EU in the framework of the uh, privacy. Uh, protection, GP, GDPR, and uh, in, in, in the context of the correlation with China, we have a RCEP as was discussed in the, uh, uh, this uh, session. So somehow, you know, even though there are various uh, policy options relating to the data governance, Japan tried to be a bridge among those kind of the, the, the ma major power. And also they tried to, the Japan tried to bring the issue together with the Singapore and uh, Australia in the WTO process, even though we are not sure at this moment still the final destination. So, you know, the, the, those kind of breaching role by a kind of the, how to say, the middle power uh, in this area can, can be very important in the, you know, the construction of the, the, the future of the international economic order. Of course, even though this is interesting, but uh, whether they can have uh, enough domestic support sometime uh, is a bit uh, uh, difficult, but still uh, it's a uh, uh, very uh, potential uh, strategy which can be a challenge. That, that's what I think in, in, on this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the time is uh, running and uh, uh, we have very interesting, uh, uh, very fundamental questions uh, from the audiences. And one question is probably that is very direct for uh, probably for Professor Chan uh, about uh, Taiwanese participation on CPTPP. So what is the uh, China's response to us? Uh, that, that it can be too political, so you can also respond only in the uh, economic issues. So this is for Professor Chan, maybe. How China is going in response to uh, Taiwanese participation on CPTPP? China is not a member of CPTPP, it's a player. But as a principle, China opposed Taiwan to formulate any kind of uh, officially uh, design uh, agreement. That's uh, the basic policy. And but uh, whether can have uh, uh, some other kind of arrangements, I don't know. <laughs> but officially, you know, it's the official frameworks and identified as uh, uh, you know, national identity, China opposes it. So I think uh, for sure. And uh, if that happened, um, probably will take some kind of response. I don't know. 
until now. Right. Uh, another interesting. But uh, at the same time, of course, Taiwan has all kinds of uh, economic uh, connections and bilaterals. And, but as I mentioned, uh, we should be very cautious, including China itself, how to handle Taiwan issue because the key for us is peace. If we see what happened in Europe, it's disaster if we fail to arrange. <clears throat> Thank you very much, although we have uh, many touch so touchy things about Taiwan. And we have another interesting question uh, uh, about U.S.-China trade, and that should probably for the uh, Ms. Uh, Benson. And actually, uh, uh, U.S. government seems to have been desperate about decoupling the U.S. China economies, but actually your bilateral trade has, uh, has recorded record high last year. So the uh, market is still very much functioning in that way. So the question is, while the U.S. government seeks to control trade in strategic goods with China, will it allow uh, trade in most other non-strategic goods to expand freely through the uh, market mechanism? And that's the questions for the uh, U.S. Thank you. It's a good question that comes up quite frequently, and we just had fresh trade data come in that supports exactly that point, which is that overall trade volumes are growing. And I think this plays into what a lot of people have been saying, which is that the administration approach is not to decouple. They've been fairly direct about that. Uh, they are just trying to decouple in high-tech sectors like chips that have military applications. Um, what that portends in the long run, I think, remains to be seen. Uh, but there is a real skepticism here about building a barrier, building a wall, uh, and a desire to maintain uh, open business ties. I referenced earlier a report we did about um, reshoring and nearshoring supply chains to Mexico. And I actually had this very interesting conversation with a small business owner in California, and we asked exactly this question. And he said, well, I can't just pick up my supply chain out of China and move to Mexico. I've spent decades cultivating relationships. I know people on the ground. I have suppliers. Um, I have established business. And I think that the administration knows it's not in everyone's interest to really encourage uh, the movement of supply chains completely away in a lot of areas. That being said, when it comes to strategic export controls, we're at the tip of the iceberg, I believe. Uh, the October 7th controls on advanced AI chips to China are likely to be iterative. The administration has hinted that there are forthcoming controls on uh, potentially quantum inputs. And then the other big hammer that's anticipated to drop soon is an executive order screening or potentially blocking outbound investment into uh, what are deemed national security critical industries. And so I think we could see a, a foresee a scenario in which trade continues down this path in some areas, uh, but it does begin to separate in, in others. Okay. Um, right. Uh, and there's another question uh, which may go to uh, Shiroyama Sensei, and that is on the uh, data control policies. And uh, uh, well, the uh, the person who's asking this question says that it looks uh, like the policies uh, in U.S. or the Japan seems to be getting more and more for the controls, uh, just uh, emphasizing the uh, the roles in the uh, security rather than economic efficiencies. So uh, U.S. banned that TikTok and also shut down all the uh, access for the uh, uh, Chinese telecom companies to U.S. market. So it's getting more and more controls over the data. So what we can do, uh, whether we, we should follow it or we should have independent, different ideas on it. So what is your response? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. And uh, as I mentioned in the initial remarks, and there, there is an inherent conflict of the trade-off of the policy objective and the, you know, the, the rule relating to the data governance. It means the trade-off between the free data flow and privacy protection or cybersecurity or the uh, 
financial regulation, industry policy, and security, and so on. So the po potential, ex the you know, the the conflict is inherent in that. It's not necessarily a new one. Then, then the question is that how to deal with that kind of the potential uh, trade-off. So one of the danger uh, currently going on is that you know, the how to say the yellow of the the security can be ex exp expanded. You know. Uh, in a very ambiguous way, so we have to think about the you know more the differentiated treatment. You know, we have to of course we have to deal with the narrow security issue, but it is different from the you know effective regulation issue or the industrial policy issue or the cyber security issue and so on. So you know, try to develop the differentiated strategy and try to how to say the narrow down the potential scope of the security issue rather than you know. In the name of the general secretarization, everything can be dealt with on the security issue. So that, that kind of the differentiated treatment might be necessary to respond to the kind of the issue which is raised. Thank you. And also there's another uh, interesting question related to RCEP. All, almost all, all participants mentioned did mention about RCEP and CPTPP. Uh, to be the uh, base of uh, future uh, rulemaking in these regions. And probably this one should go for Shiro-san and in some part, uh, Ms. Benson. So, uh, so, uh, so we have both CPTPP and RCEP in Australia and Japan especially. And of course, uh, we are very serious about RCEP too, right? In keeping the momentum for the traditional uh, trade-driven growth, right? So, um, so the questioners uh, seems to be interested in the uh, whether RCEP should be the uh, real can be the uh, real driving force in this uh, regional trade, or maybe we can try to combine the CPTPP with the IFOs, trying to even invite China to CPTPP. So, Shiro Sans, what is your response? Yeah, thanks. And, and that relates to the previous question on, on Taiwan's um, bid to join the CPTPP. Um, I think, well, first of all, to recognize that both the United States and China have uh, championed the free trade area of the Asia Pacific through APEC. Uh, and that, of course, includes APEC members um, and has been seen as, as C, uh, TPP and RCEP as pathways towards this free trade area of the Asia Pacific. So I think that's a useful way of um, kicking the issue down the road uh, and having a big um, agreement on the horizon that will take a long time to move towards anyway. And, and so long as RCEP and T CPTPP remain open to new members um, and less damaging to non-members so that they have more open regionalism characteristics, more multilateral characteristics than, than otherwise, um, they should both be seen as, as useful uh, vehicles for making progress. Um, I think they're both big enough to be systemically important. Um, uh, you know, CPTPP has stricter rules in some areas, but as I mentioned, RCEP has um, its economic cooperation agenda um, right in the middle of it. So there's potential there for uh, closer economic and political cooperation, building trust through that process. And I think that's where, you know, to come back to the Taiwan question even, um, um, you know, CPTPP is currently dealing with UK accession um, and potential membership, and that's that's difficult enough. It's going to be much harder to consider Chinese membership, uh, and it should rightly um, take that on as a, a, a priority issue. China's put its hand up for the rules that the, the Japan, Australia, United States, and others wrote. Um, we should um, test uh, the reform credentials that Zhang Yunling mentioned and define the reform. Chinese reforms that are necessary um, over time. And I think the formula is already there for um, potential Taiwan membership eventually, um, potentially with China, just as uh, APEC and the WTO, which of course are a world away from present circumstances. But there is a formula there. And if you um, take countries at their word about the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, um, Taiwan's, of course, uh, a member of APEC as an economy, 
Um, and I think that is, there have to be some, of course, um, creative ways forward and some hard work on the diplomatic front. Um, but these are things that should not be ruled out and should be explored and fruitful ways to, to discuss this um, as we move forward. Okay, I think uh, um, it's a kind of consensus between Japan and Australia, the member of CPTPP. So, uh, Ms. Benson, you mentioned about IPEF, uh, but there is a certain disappointment about the U.S., just uh, U.S. abandoned TPP, and then U.S. never has committed to any kind of tariff-related negotiation. And so in that sense, uh, many Asian company, uh, countries, even including Japan and Australia, uh, well, still, we wish the U.S. to come back to the uh, traditional trade arena. And if there is any possibility for that, uh, we would appreciate your comments. And uh, maybe uh, if time, is, time remains, uh, uh, we may have some responses uh, if uh, Dr. Chang Yun-lin responds to us, the Taiwan issue on, in TPP. Thank you. Sure, I think that the disappointment for the United States leaving TPP is not unique to foreign partners. That's something that's come up very frequently in Washington recently, which is, why don't we just rejoin? Uh, and if that's not a possibility, which I don't think it is, uh, then how do we make the Indo-Pacific economic framework something that's durable? And right now, the way that the IPEF is designed is essentially the United States negotiating statements of principles without offering concessions. And so this goes back to my earlier remarks on building incentives. And we actually did a long project looking at the decarbonization pillar of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Who will pay for it? What will it consist of? What do the actual incentives look like? And pretty quickly, it becomes very complicated. Uh, I know that we in Japan and Australia have tried to stand up a joint financing mechanism uh, in the past, and that was three parties. So expand it to 14 parties, and quickly the incentive mechanism looks almost untenable. Uh, so I think it will really fall on the United States to prove that this is something comparable. Uh, but it really does not look likely because trade is such a political issue in the United States right now. And I don't think that that is something that will change under different political leadership. Uh, we've done a very poor job of explaining the benefits of trade, uh, and it, it is not a top issue of importance to American voters. I think if you look at the nine top issues that people tune into in a political way, uh, trade is number eight out of nine. And so we're already seeing a lack of engagement by the American public to demand more, to demand that we participate, that we're at uh, the table and that we can cooperate with our allies in an economically meaningful way. Uh, so I am not optimistic, but this is a concern that many people in Washington share, and uh, they see the missed opportunity and continue to uh, encourage a rethink of that particular policy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, probably just one, two, one minute and a half for uh, Dr. Chang Yun Lin uh, about the uh, ideas, Shiro-san's ideas of both China and Taiwan at the same time as a member of CPTPP? Well, probably. So, you have any response towards it? Uh, I think it's, I don't know how to arrange in the future. It's, uh, because the situation is different from when China uh, joined APEC and WTO. Uh, you know, it's the situation's policy con consideration is quite different because now, as I mentioned, the same as politics come to the fore. And uh, what China worries about, and, uh, you know, uh, they make Taiwan as independent uh, state. And so any legal process will be, uh, I think, is very cautious about. But in the future, how we arrange, probably rely on our wisdom, how to find a way. <laughs> but currently, it's both, I, I think, is, it seems quite different. Uh, one, we are living in a 
uh, diversified or fragmented uh, region, world. So we find a way how to, uh, you know, find the rooms, how to live in better rather than worse. The second, and we don't know how long, how long it will last, this politics and political come to forefront because of the shift of the power relations and power itself and uh, rethinking of emerging more nationalism uh, because of many reasons. Uh, so it's very dangerous. So I wrote uh, several articles called on the 21st century, the key number one thing is how to keep our world and region peace, peaceful. So, uh, that's a big lesson for Europe has failed to handle, and they should be the way how to handle it better than what happened now. But Asia Pacific, East Asia, uh, you know, it's very risky. And Korean Peninsula, uh, South China Sea, Taiwan issue, and uh, Indo-Pacific, US strategy, US unstable policy for the future. Who knows what about uh, US future policy and, and uh, you know, but so this kind of thing we have to handle very carefully. Uh, but fortunately, we have a, a, a very strong economic interest. Each politician need a strong economy. And, and people, you know, uh, ask for a better life. That's probably the foundation for that. And people will not support the war, support the big confrontation. That's all. That's okay. All. Thank you very much. So this might be a very nice conclusion for this uh, session today. <laughs> we have to find a way for the uh, pros more the world of prosperity, better today, uh, better tomorrow than uh, <clears throat> today. Okay. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. And uh, uh, well, despite my mismanagement, still there can be a lot of nice discussions about the future ideas. So I think uh, your professional uh, ideas continues to work on this uh, sheets, and uh, we we will be able to work together uh, in the uh, uh, hopefully some uh, future opportunity. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.